So welcome back everybody. This is Night Flight and today we are talking to Joe Atwill again and our subject will be religion and politics. Is there really a separation between church and state as we all think? And um, or is it fact or fiction? <laughs> so we will see about that. Um, I remember the late uh, Jordan Maxwell. He always said that there is no religious movement that is not a little bit political and there is no political movement that is also not a little bit religious. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, I suppose so, but I would go further and say that really historically there hasn't been any distinction between church and state. Religion mm -hmm. has been an, a function uh, or a, an aspect of state governance. Uh, people have thought of, it, for example, Christianity. I mean, you, you, I think you've seen my book, Caesar's Messiah, mm -hmm. where I show that the, the religion came from the Roman political class, the Caesar's families, and um, it was a, a camouflage, uh, a way to um, basically affect uh, social change in the direction that they wanted uh, by using people's you know, belief in God uh, as, a, as a tool of, of the state. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> this concretely manifested uh, in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, where uh, eventually Christianity became the state religion. And so there wasn't really any distinction whatsoever during that period, you know, between church and state. Um, after the Reformation and the Renaissance, there was a you know, there, there were different political powers and structures that were coming into place that were opposing uh, the, the Christian, um, you know, dominance of, of Europe. But I think they were primarily, um, you know, uh, just would, would like to have repeated the same situation that uh, the, um, the Romans set up with the Dark Ages. Um, I think that Freemasonry, for example, became very powerful. Um, you know, uh, you had um, Lord Palmerston in the middle of the 19th century um, setting up basically a Freemasonic system of governance throughout all of Europe, which never really went away. Um, Freemasonry didn't publicly declare its, its religious position but I think that it's it was very much following the model of the uh, of the Roman Caesars, who you'll notice didn't publicly disclose their creation and, and control over Christianity. So with um, you know with uh, I, and I would say that Freemasonry is really best understood as a uh, at its highest level as an annex of uh, a, a fraction of Judaism there would be a, a group that would uh, would not be regular Jews, not sort of Jews on the street, but there were people who would think of themselves sort of uh, historically as uh, be basically the people who fought against Rome in the first century, that, that zealot cohort, you know, of, of Jews who, who rebelled from Rome. And they never were really extinguished, and uh, they, had, they adopted an identity, the Freemasons, to camouflage their, you know, who, who they were. But uh, then they um, set up many states, you know, like with Palmerston or George Washington. I mean, George Washington, our you know, founding president, um, he took the oath of office wearing a Freemason apron. So you can see, you know, the, the U.S. was really a Masonic project, which is to say it was a religious project. Um, the the separation of church and state, which became, you know, an issue when there were so many different uh, religions and, uh, and also when secularism, you know, became popular. I mean, this wasn't something that existed in the Middle Ages, but when secularism became sort of a legitimate cultural entity, um, it demanded civil rights for itself, you know, saying, look, we, we don't worship in the ways that uh, the church, the state wants us to. But we, you know, want civil rights, and so you had uh, civil rights over time granted to this group, 
Um, but I don't think that the state ever lost its religious perspective for a minute. I, I think that, um, and, and that, you know, and it's, and in an odd way, I don't think that the religion that the state operated really saw itself as a, as a, you know, as a legitimate religion. I mean, certainly in, with Catholicism, this is, this is, uh, an illusion, you know, the, the faith that the popes and the administrative class have is just something that they present to the public. Right. They, they don't they're not sincere in any way. And I don't think at the uh, at the very top level of uh, Freemasonry, I don't think they're sincere either. I think they they think of religion as a tool. And so when you get into the idea of religion and, you know, as a, you know, an aspect of politics and the, the advocation of, of a separation between church and state, I just think this is naive. I think that this is this idea comes from a misunderstanding of reality where they don't see that um, that there isn't any difference between the church and state historically. There wasn't in during the era when uh, you know Catholicism was powerful. There wasn't any during the 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 system of the pharaohs, <laughs> and then and there isn't any now. It's uh, it's just it's it's a little more difficult to see, but it comes up from time to time where you can actually see it. And I, I would just say as one example. I'll give a couple examples. I mean, one would be uh, 911, um, which was a, you know, it was a religious uh, sort of uh, theatrical production. You know, they 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 chose the date because that was it's a manifestation of or typologic manifestation of the date that the temples of Judaism had been destroyed. Um, the Jewish temple had been destroyed. Or, twice and uh, you know once and um and, and very early and then in uh, seven in 70 uh you know with the romans they 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 leveled it but on both times both times when the babylonians and the romans when the temple was raised it was on a particular date which you would manifest in the hebraic number system as 911 so this was why that was why that date was chosen because they wanted to to make this political statement, but it's also kind of a religious one. To your point, of we're setting up a new world order. There's, this is the the post Christian era, and now it's this Masonic Jewish era that is coming into power. And they chose the date of uh, 2001 because this is the first year of the this new millennium. And then they choose 911 to represent uh, kind of revenge against the um, uh, the Romans who had who had uh, raised the temple and then claimed it was on that date, even though this was um, you know sort of complicated. You'd have to read Caesar's Messiah, but the, Rome set up the date uh, um, just to mimic you know the the first destruction of the temple. And what they're trying to do is to say to the Jews, look. God has ordained this. This is why the temple was destroyed on this particular date. This is exactly the same date. Now it's the same lesson. You know, you're evil, you're rebellious. And so we have, we've chosen the date, the Rome, the temple was destroyed in this date, but it's obviously fictional. This is, this did not happen on that date. They, they couldn't have organized it in that way. And so it's just a, um, it was just a representation, a symbolic representation which is pretending to be religious, but is actually just statecraft, you know, manifestation of control. And so when they when they set up um, 911 in the United States, they just mimicked the whole thing. And even down to having the Solomon building, that's one of the buildings destroyed, you know, mimicking the Solomon's temple, you know, in the first, the first destruction. So, um, so you can see that, you know, you have this blending of state and religion which is neither really, uh, it, which is really, it's only religious in the symbolic form and the, you know, the oligarchs who are running it, they get amusement evidently out of their, uh, their symbolism, you know, the way they represent what, you know, who they are, what they're doing in these cryptic ways that the public is too stupid to understand. So, so they do it in this way. Um, they're evil, you know, to use a word. So they just enjoy it. And, and this is why they chose 911. And, um, and then uh, the, this other example I think I would give is uh, Netanyahu's um, use of the term Amalek uh, in, in as far as the uh, destruction of the Palestinians. 
Um, this is really grisly stuff. I mean, uh, the Amaleks were, you know, an ethnicity that harassed the Israelites during the uh, 40 years of wandering. And uh, God, I mean, of course, this is, would be the oligarchic manifestation of God in their scripture, you know, which is, of course, pretends to be religious, but is actually, you know, political statecraft, right, to get to your point. So when you look at the Old Testament, you're just looking at the oligarchic way of inspiring, you know, better uh, efforts from their soldiers, basically, you know, to, but in any case, so God tells, according to the author, you know, that we got the instructions from God that the Amaleks can be destroyed down to the last child. This was the key here. And then Netanyahu during the um, genocide of the Palestinians, uh, re the, which is ongoing, he said that he compared the Palestinians to Amaleks. Now, he was called on this. I mean, people said, well, gee, this just seems to be the most nihilistic, you know, uh, description imaginable because here you are actually killing children. And then to, you know, use this biblical expression, which describes the this, this destruction of an ethnicity down to the last child just seems, well, evil. And then Netanyahu went sideways, you know, and he said, well, <clears throat> I'm using it in a different term, a different way. It's, it's a little more nuanced. There's, there's some, you know, you don't understand Jewish history. You know, it's a, he went sideways on it, but um, this is preposterous because, um, you know, the, the fact that he would be killing children and then using an expression which is, can certainly be understood as promoting the killing of children um, couldn't be circumstantial, right? I mean, this would just, this is ridiculous. And so... He knew what he was doing, and um, he was basically cursing them and creating a, a religious rationale for the state's behavior. So you can see in all these examples, you know, from uh, you know from the first century to the Palestinian genocide going on now, you have really the uh, trying to de to de to delineate between the state and religion is. Um, uh, is the wrong direction to head analytically. Really what you want to do is try to recognize that they're both the same thing. And, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and the sort of natural human need for spirituality doesn't really manifest itself in warfare and, and uh, it just isn't sort of a natural link. Whenever religion is, is sort of visible politically. It's it's something that I would say is just a tool of the oligarchs to bamboozle the public. They they use our weakness of um, need for spirituality uh, for their control uh, over us. Mm -hmm. um, nine um, is September 11 as far as I know if memory serves but I'm pretty sure um, was also the ancient Egyptian New Year was it it's quite possible I mean they I, I wouldn't be surprised if all of the dates are um, just chosen for a symbolic person and there's no history there at all because the triangle between politics religion and history is just a blur of, of uh, you know, oligarchic symbolism. I, I, I point out in Caesar's Messiah, I said, look, once you actually understand what is going on here uh, in terms of, of uh, who is in back of this, this literature, who's in back of the Gospels, and who's in back of the writing of Josephus, which is recording the supported history, you lose all, 100%, of the dating system of the first century. There is just no way to know when any of these events actually occurred because the dates are all symbolic. They're all chosen for political purpose. Hmm. So there's no reality to them. <clears throat> and so the, 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 the history we have, um, like I, I you know, mentioned that we know more about the future than we do about the past because, <laughs> because the future, at least, is tabula rasa. We don't know what's going to happen, and you know we might get a chance to see the reality with our eyes. But the past, the history we have, is all lies. It's all just um, 
uh, it's all political uh, propaganda to control us, you know. And so, um, uh, you know, that's why the uh, the question of of the of the relationship between religion and state is literally the most important question we have because that's the question that will answer uh, what we need to know about our present moment. You know, this will if we understood kind of the religious symbolism and and the relationship between our political class and Freemasonry, our political class and, and uh, uh, Judaism uh, are in the first century, the political class and uh, Christianity. Y you just have such a clear understanding of the world. I mean, imagine a European serf in the year 700 and he's being told about Jesus and he's been shown this political structure above him that is relating somehow to Jesus. If he had the clear mindedness, if he or she had the, the clear mindedness of what the reality was, they could have rebelled, you know, I think um, more efficiently and uh, and could have organized themselves better. So the 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 idea that you know you have this a religious re, sort of historical reality, um, you know, you just have to try to take that with a grain of salt and. I mean, really, what I suggest is um, is just uh, you know adopting the religion of the Socratic method, which is to say, you know, facts and reasoning, and try to understand logic, and try to understand and try to vet every single fact that's given you, to come up with either the unknown, which so it's something we don't know the truth of, or to uncover sophistry. You know, I mean, these are the things we'll most often find if we use that method in terms of what what is history or what is current political uh, reality, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the situation in America where we have someone who is, I mean, to use an expression, senile, running for, you know, the presidency. Uh, is this a real political theater or, 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 or is it just all, I mean, how, how can this be real, you know? So I, I just... Um, it's a strange world uh, because there is so much uh, history and, and belief that are in things which are propaganda and sophistry. So many people you meet on the street um, and uh, so many of the sort of ways that people understand the world today are based on total misunderstandings of, of, of history, of mm. And, and of course, that then um, makes the, the, the fact that the personalities are also not real. You know, I use the expression of lifetime actor, which is to say someone who is completely fake. In other words, the, the projection of his personality is fake. Um, it's not a real personality. It's just done for political control. Joe Biden, the president, getting back to him, he would be photographed... Um, uh, having ash on his forehead on Ash Wednesday, which is a Catholic mm -hmm. tradition. So he would be doing this with the idea of giving the impression he's a devout Catholic, which is, of course, completely ridiculous. And, um, you know, he, he is uh, someone who is working hard to destroy Catholicism in America in every way he can. And his, his virtually his entire cabinet, his, his uh, government are Jews. So what happened to Catholicism? I mean, where is it? And is, it is, there isn't, I don't think there's a legitimate um, like practicing Catholic in the entire administration. Mm -hmm. And yet he creates this impression, you know, to get votes that he is a, a devout Catholic. So again, you know, since the political class is using propaganda relentlessly, it is relentless. They never vary from propaganda everything they do is propaganda their whole the whole reality they that they create or the, that they give to you as reality is designed as propaganda mm. and so and so you um uh you, you can only meet it make sense of it uh, through logic and reasoning you know you have to vet every single claim um and and then you have to not take uh, for granted the uh, identities that they present to you. 
because the identities they present to you is probably the most powerful um, propaganda element, you know? So it's a difficult world um, to have a sense of reality, what's real. Um, I, I, don't, I don't even think that it's, that's even something that's possible at this point. I think we can, have a, we can have a sense of what's logical. We can have a sense of what's rational. When we look at 911, for example, and you see the building collapse at free fall speed symmetrically, um, this is in defiance of the laws of physics in terms of it's just a you know fire. Fire would topple the building in an asymmetrical way. It wouldn't, you know, and it certainly wouldn't come down at free fall speed. So when you see this, you know, okay, th there had to have been controlled demolition. So this is a, a strand of reality that you can follow, and then you can you can understand well there has to be then an organization to have done this. The media has to be in, in relationship to this organization because they, if they were honest, they would, they would start exposing all of this. So the, these are the ways you can come to the best understanding of the world. You mm -hmm. know, by, by that, I mean, most accurate understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a, you know, once you kind of flip the bit, you know, and you transition to this method, um, it's not an easy life, you know, because you don't have the kind of sense of, the, the, the planks of culture aren't really the things you can stand on, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, so you're always a little off balance, but, you know, in the long run, you just, this is how you can live your best life because you're not going to be fooled as often. And you're going to, to be working uh, politically to try to, um, uh, you know, stop genocide and, uh, I mean, like, well, look at the vaccine mandates, for example, just so recent. I mean, this was this was something that really needed to be resisted, to be rebelled against. Um, and, and citizens needed to, uh, you know, exercise the right of self-defense. Um, so that position was available to those who went through the claims about the vaccine and the disease, honestly. Um, but it wasn't. You know, people who just believe the the dream world, they rolled up their sleeves and took the vax. Well, you know, they had no idea what was going to happen to them. They were giving up the rights of their genetic operations to the state in, in a way. And so, um, you know, that's that this is kind of a bifurcation moment. I mean, it's like with uh, I, I said that the vaccines were really useful because they separated out, they purified um, the class of people who have the capacity to rebel. You know, everyone I know who, who didn't take the vax is, is actually someone I can talk to about many other things. And almost everyone that I know who took the vaccine um, is mindless. You know, and I, I don't mean that in a, you know, they're not stupid, but they're, they don't have an active, engaged mind that has, uh, to use the expression, has stepped into its own power mm -hmm. and it has agency. They're yeah. just, they, they, may, they may think they have, you know, they may be confused and think that they're independent, but really their ideas, you know, they believe the, the history, they believe the patriotism, they believe the, the things that are being given to them for control. And so when the, the choice came up about whether or not to take the vaccine, they just rolled up their sleeve without thinking that they had been completely manipulated throughout their entire life to this ir irrational and self-destruction act. A and then we turn around and accuse the unvaccinated of, you know, uh, not following the science or, um, uh, you know, uh, not, not wanting to be, uh, helping protect grandmom, you know, from getting the disease. I mean, just, they were, they were so irrational. It was, it was preposterous, but I, I actually saw this as very useful because it just delineated so completely, you know, and, and the unvaccinated sort of coalesced, even now there's still some, you know, kind of centrifugal sort of energy pulling them to one another because um, uh, they, 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 found one another, you know, in, in, in that process, you know? And so, um, so there it is. I mean, church and state, no, it, it isn't really, 
to me, it is, this isn't really the important question. It's, it's the, the important question is how, is how state uses religion and mm -hmm. how religion uses the state. Uh, and, and they really aren't a separate thing. It's just one pulse of power with different ways of presenting itself so that um, the public doesn't recognize who's in control. Yeah. You know, that's, you know. And so if there is no real separation, then it is also not surprising that both institutions use um, similar mechanisms to nudge people into certain directions. Uh, one is a savior program. You have that in politics and in religion. Here's yeah. your set of rules. If you follow them, you go to heaven or you will be raptured or whatever it might be, you go straight to paradise. <laughs> and so, yeah. and uh, in the political world, um, I remember, for instance, Obama, yes, we can. And everybody thought, oh, this is a new dawn of uh, wonderful things to come. And uh, <clears throat> only this party can uh, turn the country around. So th these promises combined with a savior program that is um, very, very obvious. Both institutions are so entwined with those ideas. So it no longer surprises me <laughs> that, uh, I, I mean, I have observed that for many, many years, and uh, but it's usually hard to explain to people. Sometimes they probably really don't know what you mean, or they act as if they don't understand. It's because they are um, in the thrall of the uh, savior, um, you know, uh, fantasy. It's such a powerful tool for mind control. I mean, Obama, a great example. Um, Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, I think in the first week of his presidency when all anyone knew about him was his wardrobe. I, I mean, what had he done? But it didn't matter. He, he had just taken on the mantle of the savior because he was black. And for the liberals, they thought this was, uh, you know, kind of, you know, form of emancipation, I think, and and somehow would have uh, you know effects on uh, you know to rectify slavery, you know, um, the the African American community in the United States had nothing but a straight downward trajectory during Obama's presidency. Every yeah. negative demographic simply either accelerated or stayed in, the, in place. Uh, violence through the roof. Education went nowhere. Um, they they got more political power. There was there was more sort of you know to use an expression affirmative action political individuals people who were really uh, basically just had their race as their the basis for their of their qualifications. But this there really wasn't a, a renaissance of African-American intellectualism. Um, I think on the contrary, rap music became more powerful. Um, Obama was a cultural uh, degenerate. I mean, he, he, he would watch Jersey Shore, this culturally destructive and, and actually knew the names of the individuals in the, in the TV show would mention them like Snooky, I think her name was just this little cultural degenerate. Um, so in every way he was promoting the, uh, you know, the destruction of the sort of intellectual stature of mankind and the family structure and the, you know, and sexual restraint, you know, something, things that are needed to, to have civilization. So the hope that the uh, black community had for their, their future with Obama was just tragically, uh, misplaced, you know, and uh, in fact, I've said that um, it, it would have been much better if, if they hadn't had Obama for the African American community, because they would have kept trying to find a leader, you know, and then of course, if you look, Obama is what I call a lifetime actor, if you look at his mother's background, or 
her connection to Gregory Bateson, you know, who's one of the kind of oligarchic anthropologic operatives, you know, you can see where, where he comes from, his background, his mother's background is very much CIA and uh, influence. And so he was a controlled being um, and he was a lifetime actor. He, he was just always giving the impression that I, I'm a black person. I have agency as a black person. I'm going to help the black people and we're going to have this uh, multicultural workers paradise, you know, but then he takes office and does he, you know, question the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the credit creation power of the federal reserve. Does he try to audit the federal reserve to see who's really getting the money? You know, um, what about wars? I mean, he was, he was a war monger. Every single war that was possible, he, he waged, you know, war. So he was a tool of the oligarchs and that's, that's who he was. And, and, um, uh, you know, he was the, he had this mantle of the savior. And so your critique of that concept is really apt, Judith. I mean, you're absolutely right, is that once they put the mantle of the savior on someone, it's hard for hoi polloi to not just follow them. And so what you have is the, is the method by which the hoi, po, well, hoi polloi understand the savior, who it is. That's really where the evil is. It's in... I mean, where does Obama come from? How does he end up in the Chicago convention being able to speak to the party four years before he's a, he's a candidate when he hasn't even, no one even knows who he is? You know, um, again, it's sort of like his Nobel Prize for his wardrobe, um, his, his ability to have this political power right off the bat is, is just inexplicable. And obviously, you know, you're dealing with someone who is... Uh, you know, is a shill, is a, a, a fake personality, someone who's controlled for, and, and you know, really does bleed into our topic about church and state because Obama was a religious leader, you know, in, in the sense of the savior. You know, he, he was really quite religious. Um, and, um, and then look what you got, you know, you got this warmonger, um, you know, kind of, uh, person who who is more likely to be in a meeting of uh, you know the banking class than uh, you know in in uh, the inner city. Um, I I knew people in Chicago where he he was supposedly a uh, uh, community activist. I think was the, the the job description he had claims he had. Well, I knew people who were community activists in Chicago. They never saw him. They didn't know who the heck he was. They go where 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 was he? He's like, we never saw him, you know? So, you know, this is the thing. Again, if you use uh, scrutiny with, you know, logic and, and reasoning, if you take the, if you use the Socratic method and just have this, the basic question, is this a real personality? Is, is, is the descriptions that he's giving of him reflecting of his real life and of his real being? you can break down the, the falseness very easily. And, and you just have to always, as I said, vet these things carefully, and then you're not going to be constantly fooled. Yeah. And I have to say, even if I sound like a broken record, but understanding this, staying away from savior programs has personally saved me from a lot of nonsense i remember for instance when QAnon came on the stage right right yeah. um i i watched a couple of videos and then i smelled <laughs> the bad fish the savior program and immediately dropped it and uh, didn't pay any further attention to it because i knew then and there it will lead nowhere you, um, it's a shame more people didn't have your uh, sort of, you know, objective, you know, analytic position on that. It, it, QAnon was one of the most ridiculous. I mean, it literally was, it was just, it was stupid. And the fact that it did fool so many people. But, you know, I wonder, because even the idea that there were a lot of followers is an artificial concept. It's something that comes to us through the pixelated reality. You know, we 
we don't really, I don't really, I didn't know anyone who actually was into QAnon, but I knew a lot of people who were upset about QAnon or, or thought it was this, I'm sure some people did get fooled, but I wonder how many, because again, you know, these concepts of what's real are, that are coming to us through the internet are so easy to manipulate. And, and, um, but I do think that like in October, or, excuse me, on the January 6th, when you had the, uh, the demonstration uh, in at, at the Congress, you know, which was then called mm -hmm. an insurrection, you know, by the political class. Um, I think some of the people who were there to demonstrate had been influenced by the QAnon uh, uh, sort of mystique. Um, so it did have some influence on people, which is tragic because it's just, you know, it, it's just so stupid. Um, and um, and and now as we go into the new political, you know, to the presidential election, I wouldn't be surprised if something like that comes back, uh, you know, white hats, black hats, secret, you know, meetings, which, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's um, the, this, the current political race in America will be the most debased cultural moment we've ever experienced. I, I'm actually predicting that Trump may put be put in prison to run the campaign as a jailbird. And during that time, um, he there will be a, like a sex tape released about him and Stormy Daniels or something that will just take the, take the culture down even further. And then at the same time, Biden's dementia will get worse so that you'll have a incarcerated pornographer um, of running against someone who is, you know, just profoundly senile, and this will be our our democratic moment. But you you know you you see you see what what they're doing is they're debasing the idea of democracy with these candidates. They're they're um, and this goes to church and state again and to savior. You know what they're doing is they are putting candidates out that are so ludicrous. That, that the public will stop thinking about the democratic process as having any meaning. This is a way that the mythology of democracy, which is potentially dangerous to the oligarchs and that you know, they know that people will try to maybe use the system for it to, rep to get representation for their interests at some point. They'll, they're taking that away from us at this point. They're, they're going to run more and more ludicrous um, uh, you know, events. And I mean, I thought the election in France uh, was was absurd. And uh, it, it strikes me as artificial. You know, I don't, you know, you know, in, in the analytic world, because that's the world I try to live in, you don't really have, you know, uh, the, the capacity to really know, honestly, you know, or in the sense of like, empirically, Oh, your your sound is gone. Did who was controlling the ballot to get this absurd result? And I don't, but and I don't trust it. At the same time, I recognize Judith. I don't know. I mean, how could I know from my living room with my computer what the reality is inside of France? You know, I'm just saying, I don't buy it. I don't take it as a as a premise of reality or as a. I don't accept it as a you know, like, like something that's, that's real because it, it just doesn't make analytic sense. And, um, and that's why, you know, it, it's, it, well, as an example, it's like a, uh, the October 7th Hamas invasion of Israel, right? Now, I, I, I don't know the truth, but I don't believe it because when I look at the uh, Elbit automated border technology, okay, it's so immense and, and it's so thorough. Uh, and I have people that I've talked to that worked with the IDF um, at some point in border technology say it's just impossible, right? It's impossible for something to get across the border and not be blown up because they, it, part of the automated system isn't just surveillance. They have like landmines and, and machine guns that are robot controlled, you know, so they have all of this technology. But they certainly have surveillance, which is 
guaranteed of an instantaneous response from the IDF with, you know, um, helicopters, which are, would, would shoot, would just blow that, you know, 1,200 people coming across, but just blow them to bits. So how could it be that, that there was no response for seven hours? Mm. Well, you see, analytically, this is simply a stand down. It's a kind of false flag. They, there may have been legitimate Hamas terrorists who were coming across the border, but they could have been created and fomented and, and, and set in motion by, pol by political leaders who are actually shills that were just getting them to go across the border and murder people. And this was done as, as in a controlled way so that Israel, the, Israel would then have the pretext, right? They could go to the world and say, look, they're beheading babies, they're raping women. I mean, the, these are, I, you know, I knew it was fake. My, my impression was fake the very first day because the first image that came over the wire, the internet, was, remember that it was uh, the, uh, I think it's the neo like music festival. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Okay, so and the first person that they showed that, and this was the this was on the day of the event, was this beautiful woman who was from Germany, in basically a bikini, and she had been taken by the Hamas uh, terrorists and the, potentially raped and then murdered. So when I saw this, this image, so that the first image is of a beautiful woman in a bikini, this is the wartime journalism of, of, of the event. I said, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense at all. So I'm just pointing out that in religion, with the savior, with the claims of the politicians, the, the citizen, you know, we have our wits, we have our ability for, for logic we know when things are inexplicable and when they're inexplicable we have to stop and then try to come up with the best rationale for the event that we can and at, at one seven there is no way israel has been able to make the case that there was this terrorist invasion it just is not um there isn't enough reason and logic in back of their claims for anyone to take it seriously and then fascinatingly um, last week, there had been an investigation into what happened. And the investigation in Israel was brought about by the comptroller. Now, he brought the investigation because he said, wait a second, we have paid billions of dollars for this automated border technology that's supposed to blow anything up that comes across and alert the IDF immediately, right? We, we, here's how much money we spent. I'm the comptroller. I am required to find out what went wrong. Why did everything fail? How could it have failed 30 times in one day? Because there's all these different incursions. It didn't work anywhere. I got to find out what happened. And so the, the investigation went on for like a few days and then it stopped. And the rationale was that the security agency in Israel sent a, let, a letter saying, we can't have this investigation go on any further because it, it could jeopardize security secrets basically of the Israeli government. So they're almost like admitting, you know. Um, so this is our world, you know, we have our wits, we, we have, we need to develop our use of logic so that we, you know, aren't fooled by statements, by sophistry. We have to have a really keen eye for propaganda, you know, how subtle it can be. And we need to develop these skills, Judith, um, because remember, with the internet and with artificial intelligence, the oligarchs, their capacity for social control is getting greater and greater. I mean, they have tools that the Caesars did not have, right? They have, they have this media technology and, and they have psychology. I mean, MK Ultra, which mm -hmm. was an enormous program in the United States, was just designed to figure out how to control human beings. So they have been working at this diligently well, for thousands of years, and now their technology is getting really sophisticated. And so for us to keep democracy in, in existence at all, the citizen needs to develop the tools to, to, to resist the propaganda, you know. And so, you know, skepticism and logic, those are the things. And that's why, Judith, you know, I support what you do so much, because 
just the, the, the range of things that you talk about help create the understanding of other possibilities for events that are given to us as real than what the newspapers, you know, are, are telling us, you know? So it's, it's uh, the independent media is having enormous effect. And um, these are interesting times because, you know, you have this battle going on between the independent media creating skepticism and the oligarchic uh, media technology creating social control artificially. And the two are battling, you know, it's, it's, it's every day is a struggle. So, um, you know, those of, of us and, and you, you know, that are brave enough to step into this are to be praised because this is the only way that democracy can in any extent be preserved. You know? mm. Yeah, but I'm a very, very small potato. <laughs> yeah, but you see, the thing is, is remember, we, we had talked before we started recording about in Kenya, mm -hmm. where you have been making um, basically, I would say, Socratic comments to the public about, you know, how, how they could organize themselves politically more efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, what, and what was wrong, what was in contradiction to the current... Mm -hmm situation what could be improved you know and then 10 years later suddenly these things are manifesting now i'm sure it wasn't just your comments no of but, course not. Were, but at the time you were making them there weren't that many who were you know trying to bring this to the public and that because of the way the human mind works it relates well to truth <laughs> and so they could see that you know judith is right Jude, i mean the people that you were talking to could see that tribalism was really um, uh, a, a, an impediment, you know, to, to the kind of progress that they needed to make to have greater benefit for everyone. And so, or it, it, and, and so it's not to say tribalism is bad, it's just that you have to have an understanding of it and understand when it can be destructive. And the way you were explaining it to the, the public then, I, I just think it's not circumstance that 10 years later, it, it becomes something that now is in the streets in Kenya during the current you know, rebellion. Um, but I am sure you weren't the only one. I'm sure there were probably 100 people making the case yeah. then. And look what happens, you see. So when we think of like the podcasters today, well, I think it's the same kind of, uh, you know, geometric progression. Mm -hmm. When we're honest, you know, when we just try to tell the truth, we try to you know, use our mind for um, figuring out what's real, um, people relate to it. And they can, they can kind of sense who's honest and who isn't. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think that if they had brought the vaccine out in 1950, 99.9% .9 of Americans would have taken it. This, this time around, um, they didn't even get two thirds of the public to take it. And that's a direct result of the independent media is creating skepticism. Um, so today in America, 50% of the public has registered as independent. That's a complete collapse of the political parties that were 100% of the power like 50 years ago. Mm. Independence, have, that's our majority of the, the voters. Um, yeah. And of course, the, the uh, legacy media platforms like CNN and Fox News, they, I mean, I do podcasts that get more viewers than than some of their shows. Yeah. So, so you can see how ridiculous it is, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's because the public just recognizes now, and they recognize it through the works of people like you, that that they are simply propaganda platforms. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. And yeah. when you watch them, you're being subjected to a kind of um, destructive force, you know. So. Yeah. Um, I, I am, you know, it's a, it's, it's a battle every day is a battle and we, we just go on, you know, fighting the best we can. Yeah. So to wrap this up so that I can uh, let you go, I know your time is limited. Uh, would you say that although we are uh, in this battle, that ultimately people prefer protection and safety over freedom and truth? Um, well, it's, it is, that's a very hard thing to generalize on. Mm. Um, and I would say the, um, you know, it has, it has a lot to do with intelligence, but intelligence has a lot to do with how you've trained yourself, you know? And, um, 
I think that people who have, who are, anyone who can listen to your podcasts and understand what you're saying would, would never choose security over truth because they recognize that it's kind of the same thing that you may think you have security, but actually you're on a one-way shoot to oblivion, you know, when you go into the belief of the government. And when you, when you, you know, engage with Judith, it may seem dangerous, but actually this is the only hope for security you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has a lot to do with uh, just our, you know, our, our ways of thinking. Um, the, the oligarchs have used, but obviously security is something that um, the oligarchs, uh, it, like spirituality, they can use this as a tool and they know how to offer it. Um, I mean, uh, it, it has never worked out well. I mean, I would just say, the, look at the, uh, the, the Soviet Union um, and, and the Marxist you know, platform of, you know, you give me or give us your political power and we will give you security. We will give you a worker's paradise. Um, you know, and all you have to do is give up your political power. And then, you know, 60 million dead people later, you, the public realizes, well, actually, they weren't offering security. Um, so I, I, would, I would hope that people recognize that the worker's paradise that's being offered is almost always being offered by someone with who has ulterior motives, you know. And the only security that we can actually have will come through the security of logic and, and reason. You know, that this is where security is. Um, mm -hmm. If we're in a world that doesn't have that, if we have to accept inexplicable things like building that collapses symmetrically, and this supposedly was because of a plane that created another building, and uh, you know the uh, the the Hamas terrorists were able to like slaughter people for seven hours with no response. If you're in that world, you know, with with believing these things um, and thinking that you're on your way to security, no, I don't think so, Judith. I think that that world is actually. A, a basically a genocide for those people. So yeah. this is the thing is that, you know, population control is the ultimate goal here, obviously. And uh, they, they tell you they're there to help and then they assist you into the grave. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to have security, you have to be prepared to, uh, um, you know, exercise the, uh, the energy that security requires and which is, you know, thinking clearly, and, and, um, uh, and, you know, I think um, that the, you know, again, I just, I just want to praise you because bringing out podcasts like this is really the most uh, useful and, and productive thing that people can do now. Th this is it. You're, you're engaging at a kind of moment in human consciousness that's absolutely unique. You know, the oligarchs now has developed their technology. The propaganda is automated, you know. But at the same time, the understanding of that is now, for the first time, is, is widespread. And people like you have the ability to communicate. You can put out um, YouTube. You can put out information. You may only reach like 500 people. But my God, that's 500 people. You know, going back to our Kenya model, that could be 500,000 people in 10 years, you know? So um, I, I am optimistic. I think you are going to win. And uh, <laughs> it's maybe a little optimistic, but I, I, I just think uh, I, I'm, I believe in the uh, human mind and the capacity for thinking. And I just think the thinking of, of the public is going to get better and better. Mm. Yeah, you usually... Sorry. Um, no, usually when you ask people, um, list the three most important things in your life, then usually you get family, friends, health, or job, something like that. And I'm not saying these things are bad. No, of course not. But what is usually missing is truth and freedom on that list. Yeah. And if you had that, 
within everything, then all these other subjects that you mentioned, family, health, job, would be so much better. Of course. And the concern for, for family and health um, is only manifested through truth and freedom. Yeah. If without those things you don't, you're not going to have a good family and you're not going to have obviously, you know, any health. I mean, you're just going to, con I mean, look at the food people eat, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's just criminal. And so um, the, that, that is well said that those are really, you know, they think of the people often express the things that they are most worried about, you know, they're, they're worried about the, having a better family relationship or, you know, having more wealth or being healthier and but they don't realize that the, the only path for those things is not to worry about them per se but to try to develop the the you know thinking and and freedom in your own mind because then you'll be able to make decisions to bring about those things how how can someone how can someone have any health if they don't think clearly about the food and chemicals that are going into their body absolutely yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, you know, even all the lies uh, that we have seen starting with 2020, you know, if you had truth and freedom, you know, permeating the uh, entire institutions, that would have never happened. Right. Absolutely. Look, the, the governments, the oligarchs, they can only function with stupefied subjects. Yeah. I mean, this has been true. I mean, think of the pharaohs with the man god, or, or think of the, uh, you know, think of all the man gods. You know, the Roman Caesars, and then then the Freemason. You know, the treachery and all of the, the the secrecy, the secret oaths. You know, all of the hidden. Everything is hidden from the public. You know, there there isn't there hasn't been an honest politician, you know, in twenty thousand years. It seems like you know, and so we um, the public needs to um, we have to develop the honesty. You know, yeah. we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to admit when we don't know things, and uh, admit admit when we we when we've been fooled. You know, so we can we can improve our thinking and. Uh, and 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 have the the skills to have a good family and to have a you know good good health but those remembering those things are the result of this process where we're people of agency where we're people who have the power to understand what choices have to be made to be healthy to have a good family i mean you got you got to have your mind right otherwise you're just going to have it wrong <laughs> it's, a, it's as simple yeah. as that yeah, so I thank you so much. Uh, for... I, I hope we can talk again soon. Yeah, sure, sure. Definitely. Always, always a pleasure. And, and good luck to you today. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, that was it. Night flight for today. And uh, we we'll see you guys all next time. <laughs> Stay safe and so.